Hi, good morning. So true story. A few months ago, I was doing a pop-up shop uh, near San Francisco. And this woman walked in, um, and she told me about how she received her first electric toothbrush from her dentist years and years ago. And she loved it. And then she told me that that toothbrush never touched her mouth. <laughs> so I grew up uh, in Atlanta, near Atlanta, Georgia. It's a suburb outside um, of the city. And I was born in Taiwan. And my family is a conservative Taiwanese family. So we talked about sex as often as never. Uh, but growing up, um, I never had any negative connotations about sex or pleasure. Maybe because both my parents were scientists, um, but to them, they always treated sex as a part of life. Still, I don't think anyone would have bet too much money on me that I would end up being the sex, a co-founder of a sex toy company. <laughs> but yet, here we are. I received my undergrad uh, from Georgia Tech in industrial design. Sorry, is the feedback kind of, do I need, is this okay? Okay. So I received my undergraduate degree in industrial design from Georgia Tech and my master's from the Royal College of Art in London. Georgia Tech was a very technical institute in terms of design was really about user research, which to me is the fundamental of the best product design. And the Royal College was completely different. It was all about the concept and thinking about all the ways that design can exist and how it relates to people and how it relates to culture. So having these two ends really helped me to figure out who I wanted to be as a designer and what type of products I wanted to work on. And I was very much drawn to industrial design because I wanted to help people through everyday objects and I was also fascinated with manufacturing. I didn't always design sex toys. Earlier in my career, I worked as an in-house designer for Trek Bicycle for Goody Products. Um, I worked on home accessories, modern furniture. I lived on a factory for six plus months. So I had a little bit of experience seeing design and manufacturing from all different aspects. However, as I started working, however, as I started working, I hope that was real important. <laughs> Uh, as I started working, I kept noticing that I was generally the only woman on the design team. Like on the manufacturing floor, I would be the only female alongside engineers and our product managers. In the product development team, I would be the only woman, and definitely oftentimes on design teams. I remember at Trek, I was their first female industrial designer. And I remember on that first day, when I showed up, in a few hours in, we all realized they actually didn't have a woman's bathroom. And this was in 2004. So the reason I bring that up is if you put yourself in my position throughout your career and you find yourself being the only male on the team, you know, it's kind of strange, isn't it? And especially because we're designing products for both men and women, and oftentimes we're working on products that are for both sex. And if you're only on a team of men, you're omitting the perspective of half the population. So even things that are specifically female-centric, like breast pumps, tampons, and speculums, these objects were designed largely by men or men who may have asked some women, but they were designed by teams of men. And Without the perspective of women, I'm not really sure that they are the most ideal outcome. So I decided as a designer, I wanted to focus on products for women because the female perspective was very much underrepresented and their needs were underserved. Now, how did I get to designing sex toys? Okay. Um, actually, I was living in Boston at the time, and I remember going shopping for a toy, I think somewhere on Boylston Street. And even though it wasn't my first time in a sex toy shop, it was the first time I realized the products were so terrible 
and the qualities was just, just horrible. And as all of us know in this room, when you look at a product, you can tell a lot by its form, its material, its color, how it's put together. It speaks volume about the ethos of the company and the intent of the designer or inventor who came up with that item. And to me, when I see these forms, they're just kind of juvenile, outlandish, and just all around silly. And I really couldn't understand why also that they were so focused around the male anatomy, when in reality, 80% of women require clitoral stimulation to orgasm. So, okay, so this is gonna be a little bit of public service announcement, okay? <laughs> vagina is not the seed of pleasure. The vagina is a reproductive organ. The clitoris is the seed of pleasure. It is purely an organ of pleasure. Now, I cannot fault anyone for not knowing this fact because it wasn't only until 1998 that the full anatomy of the clitoris was fully documented. And currently, the entire category of adult toys is called novelty. A woman's pleasure, a woman's orgasm is not a novelty. Any pleasure is not a novelty. It is a universal human right. And because of that, it deserves a product that is just as sophisticated as any other product you would have in your life, such as cell phones, printers, laptops. I mean, can you imagine if our laptops looked like this? And after all, if anything, this should be even more designed and considered because it is something that's so intimate and personal. So in 2008, I started my first company. It was called Incognito. I brought together this idea of sex toys meets jewelry because I believe sex toys can be so much more elevated than what we were seeing. I bootstrapped the company, which was a few thousand dollars. I went to China to get some prototypes made. What was supposed to be just a few weeks turned into months, and next thing I knew, I was in China for a year. So in that year, I learned a lot of lessons, such as trying to avoid a local liquor called Baijiu. How many of you know about Baijiu? Ah. Uh. <laughs> and then also when the vendors nod to you, yes. Oftentimes it means they have really no idea what they're doing, and they're just trying to placate you. And oftentimes I've had to eat things that I didn't really want to eat in China, but that was kind of part of the whole thing. And nothing much has changed. It's still kind of the same, but I survived. And within that year, I had launched the company, and I was selling these products worldwide. A year and a half later, I was at a trade show, and I was just keeping up with my customers, and I had a new collection that I was showing them at a trade show. And that's when I bumped into my now co-founder, Michael Topolovac. He actually started Crave, but he didn't have any products at the time, and he was actively recruiting, trying to find a female co-founder lead and or head designer. Um, he, too, uh, also recognized this was a big opportunity, and that pleasure was hugely important, and you know, these, this category deserved better products. So when I met him, um, we completely aligned in terms of our mission. But the problem was, I already started a company. So he ended up buying my company to bring me on board. And so I've been with Crave since 2010. I've been responsible for all of the design of the products. We launched the world's first crowdfunded vibrator uh, in 2011. Um, that's actually this product right here called the Duet. And we've been growing at a healthy rate and been profitable for the last four years. Um, as a company, we, we've earned a lot of media attention. So much so that it's, it, it's, it's a true reflection of where we are right now as a culture. Because there's so many of these publications that normally would never have covered sex toys, vibrators, but they covered us because we're at a really interesting inflection point that we're rethinking sex, gender, pleasure. And also, we've actually never paid a cent for advertising, partially because we're not allowed. So the modern method of advertising, as you all know, is social media. We are completely banned from doing any kind of advertising on social media. 
no boosted posts, no sponsored ads, nothing. But yet, they will run Viagra ads all day long. I swear, check me on this. It's kind of strange, isn't it? So, how do you design products and build a company in a category that is so stigmatized? And first and foremost, we focus on the experience. Yes, I'm an industrial designer and we focus on products. The products are hugely important. But the products are there to support that experience and we never lose sight of that. Because so much of the experience in this category is just hideous. The products are terrible, the buying experience is awful, really bad quality, you know, all of the above. So for us to start figuring how we were going to fix this experience, we had to do a lot of listening. We have a few unique challenges um, in our category in that oftentimes you do user research and most consumer products, you do research where you're actually observing the user using the products. In our category, that's kind of creepy. <laughs> so we've had to build out a different type of user feedback system where we're able to respect the user's privacy, get feedback, prototype, iterate, and repeat. And one of the ways that we do this is that we invest heavily in our R&D facility in downtown San Francisco. We actually have a micro factory, flexible assembly line. We invest in CNC mill, several 3D printers. We have a compression molding machine. And we can also make small batch boards in-house. And all of this is a tool to support that feedback of user experience when we do our user research because we're able to get the feedback, iterate, change quickly with me and my engineers. I can print things out, evaluate them. They can, we can kill an idea very quickly. And so the cost of experimenting and trying different things are very low and enables us to move very quickly. So some of the tools that we've used, um, we are actually early adopters of Onshape. Um, we, it has helped us to succeed in several fronts. One, there are no CAD files, so there's just one version of the truth, uh, which is really convenient and allows us to be very nimble and efficient as a team. And also, access. Perhaps that's probably the most important in that there's ubiquity of access. Anyone from any place can access this file and enables us to have more design conversations more quickly and so we can focus on the products. This is called Vesper. It is a vibrator necklace, and this is the first product that as a result of this entire process. This is actually also our best-selling product. Um, it's USB rechargeable, it's multiple speeds, it's made out of surgical stainless steel. Um, and as a product, we did listen to customers. However, no one said, make me a vibrator necklace. And we didn't ask the question, would you wear a vibrator around your neck? Because they would be like, uh, have you lost your mind? <laughs> but what this is is what we call cultural listening. What we heard was, was that women wanted to feel empowered. They were so ready to have a better and smarter conversation around pleasure, around sex, around their own bodies, and around their sexuality. And that they just want to be able to express it and totally own it. So by creating a product that's both a fashion statement and it's also a functional product, it enables the user and the product to go into places that normally you know, sex toys can't. Women are wearing this to brunch, to dinners, to the club, and striking up conversations wherever they go. And oftentimes, to even start those conversations are often awkward. But because of the form, the shape, the conversation becomes fun and sometimes even serious. So that's how we got to Vesper, our vibrator necklace. And even though I'm super proud of you know, the resonance that it has had, um, you can see it on social media. People are proudly wearing this when they receive it. And it's a real true symbol of owning one's pleasure. But I'm not saying every woman needs to wear a vibrator around their neck to feel empowered. Okay, each to their own. Some women are empowered by modesty. Some women are empowered by nudity. It's, it's all good. You know, you do you. Do you. And that's literally a saying we have in the office. You do you. <laughs> so 
having good products, unfortunately, is not enough. We have learned that these products are great, but it's just not enough to break down barriers. And the truth is, when you're designing for a stigmatized category, lies and stigma thrive and whisper. And the mission of our company is to be able to help people own their pleasure. And people can't own their pleasure if they're whispering. So we had to create projects in order to push that conversation forward. And this is the result of one of those projects. This is called the Crave Portrait Project. This is a photo. Uh, this project involved us taking a photo of individuals at San Francisco's largest BDSM kink festival. So one day, we took photos of the individual in their BDSM gear, and then we invited him to come back in their everyday clothes. And what you can see here is that there's something about self-expression and pleasure that is very multifaceted and complex. Even though it's two different outfits, but it's the same person. Another project we kicked off this year is called the Crave Pleasures Tour. We, as a team, renovated a 1961 Airstream, and I, five foot nothing, 100 pound nothing, have been towing this thing across America. <laughs> Actually, right now, the Airstream is in a uh, RV park that's about an hour outside, because I did not want to be bothered like driving that thing through Boston with all the clearance. Oh my goodness, it is just like white knuckle butt clinching, you know? So anyway, so we took this 1961 Airstream, renovated, turned it into a pop-up shop. And we've been going to design festivals, conferences, startup weeks, and just kind of popping up wherever. And the best part about this is the conversations that I've had with the customers. I've seen over and over again the excitement and the engagement and the shock of the customers when they realize they can come in it's a comfortable space, and they don't have to whisper, but they can talk out loud when they visit our Airstream. They tell us they have never seen vibrators so sleek, so approachable. They had no idea sex toys could look this way. Remember that story I told you about the woman with the electric toothbrush? I met her in the Airstream. So it turns out that the conversations are good. They are powerful, and they're necessary. And there's so much more to come. Thank you. And you are welcome to reach out to me to continue this conversation via LinkedIn, Twitter, or the Gram. So thank you.